Greetings to you all. My name is Professor Anne Karagosian, and it is my pleasure and privilege as the inaugural director of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA to welcome you to our second distinguished lecture to be delivered today by Professor Taner Akjam on the subject of Jamal Pasha's role in the Armenian Genocide with discussant commentary provided by Professor Ron Suni. This is the second such lecture provided by Professor Akjam for our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute. As many of you know, Professor Akjam's two lectures had originally been scheduled to take place in person at UCLA in the spring of 2020, but the COVID-19 pandemic and campus closure led to their delay. We are absolutely delighted, however, that Professor Akjam has again agreed to provide his second distinguished lecture to us via the Zoom platform. And because of this, we are able to reach so many more of you from around the world with this lecture, which is also being recorded for future viewing. As with his earlier lecture, today, Professor Akjam's distinguished lecture pertains to one of the darkest periods in Armenian history, that of the Armenian genocide in the first part of the 20th century. The Armenian Genocide is widely documented by historians and is now recognized by numerous countries around the world, including both houses of the US Congress. And recently it has been categorized as such by the US Library of Congress. Yet the genocide is still vigorously denied by the successor to the Ottoman Empire, today's Republic of Turkey. Some might say, why remember events from over a hundred years ago can't you put the past behind you? Well, today, as we speak, we see one of the most profound reasons for remembering and documenting such evidence because some of the descendants of the perpetrators have made it clear by military actions as well as public statements that they wish to continue and finish the original campaign of genocide. Today's lecture is one part of the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute's response to the current events pertaining to the war for survival of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, that is perspectives on the planning and execution of the Armenian genocide from the, uh, from the early, early 20th century. The second part of our Promise Armenian Institute response is scheduled for Saturday, October 31, and will be an all-day conference pertaining to Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, both historical and ge geopolitical perspectives, including the current situation. But for today's distinguished lecture by Taner Akjam, I am delighted to note the co-sponsorship of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, or Nasser, the Ararat Eskijan Museum, the UCLA Richard Havanissian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History, and the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies. My UCLA colleague, Professor Sebu Aslanian, will provide formal introductions for our speakers in a moment. But first, let me note that for those of you who are currently watching live via the Zoom webinar platform, you have an opportunity to send questions to us by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom portion of your screen and typing in the question. Please be sure to be as specific as possible in your question, and we will direct as many of the questions as are practical to our lecturers when they are finished speaking. We anticipate that this lecture itself will take around an hour and that the discussant commentary will take around 15 minutes, after which we will begin the formal Q&A session. So now it gives me great pleasure to turn the webinar over to Professor Sebu Aslanian of UCLA's Department of History. Professor Aslanian is the inaugural director of the, UC, of the Armenian Studies Center within the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute, and he has been the holder of the Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History since 2012. He is the author of from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, the global trade networks of Armenian merchants from New Julfa, as well as numerous scholarly articles pertaining to early modern and modern Armenian history. Sebu, I'll now turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Anne, for that wonderful introduction. 
and uh, welcome everyone. I am Sebu David Alsanya, Professor of History and the holder of the Richard Alvanisian Chair of Modern Armenian History at UCLA. I also have the distinct pleasure of acting as the inaugural director of the Armenian Studies Program at the Promise Institute. I join my colleague, Dr. Anne Karagosian, in welcoming you all to this important event hosted by our, by our institute. I will provide first brief introductions to our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Tanner Akcham, followed by some remarks on his discussant, Professor Ronald Rigor Suni. We are truly honored and thankful today to have both of them join us in making this event possible. After my introductions, Dr. Akcham will deliver his talk for approximately an hour, as Dr. Karagosian mentioned, followed by a 10 to 15 minute discussion by Professor Suni. I ask you, the audience members again, or remind you to write down your questions succinctly as, po as succinctly as possible and to communicate them to us via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Taner Akjam is the Kalustian and Mugar chairholder in modern Armenian history and genocide at Clark University. Akjam is widely recognized as, one of the, as being one of the first Turkish scholars to write extensively on the Ottoman Turkish genocide of the Armenians in the earlier part of the 20th century. He is the author of numerous books, including his, including his award-winning The Young Turks' Crime Against Humanity, uh, subtitled The Armenian Genocide and Ethnic Cleansing in the Ottoman Empire, published by Princeton in 2012 and a recipient of the prestigious Mesa Albert Hurani Award. More recently, he is the author of The Killing, Killing Orders, Kalat Pasha's Telegrams in the Armenian Genocide, which was issued by Pal Grave in 2018. He is also the founder of the Krikor Gergerian Online Archive of Digital Documents, uh, which are hosted at the online page of the Digital Commons site at Clark, and I urge you all to uh, take the time to visit it and to see what sorts of primary documents this important archive holds. His discussant today, Professor Ronald Suni, Ronald Grigor Suni, is the Charles Tilly Collegiate Professor of Social and Political History and the director of the Eisenberg Institute of Historical Studies at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. He was the first holder of the Alex Manugian Chair in Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan from 1981 to 1995, where he founded and directed the Armenian Studies Program. Professor Suni is a prolific author with a long record of publications on non-Russian nationalities of the Russian Empire, as well as the Soviet Union, particularly those in the South Caucasus, a region that is in the news, unfortunately, uh, these days. Just to name a few of his publications, I will only note his first publication, uh, The Baku Commune, 1917 to 1918, subtitled Class and Nationality in the Russian Revolution, Princeton University Press, The Making of the Georgian Nation, Looking Towards Ararat, Armenia in Modern, Armenian, modern uh, History, The Revenge of the Past, Colon, Nationalism, Revolution, and the Collapse of the Soviet Union, Stanford University Press, The Soviet Experiment, Russia, the USSR, and the Successor States, Oxford, and most recently, uh, his quote, they can live in the desert, but nowhere else, unquote, A History of the Armenian Genocide, published by Princeton in 2015 to mark the 100th anniversary of the commemoration of the genocide. Dr. Suni has received many awards and fellowships, including a Guggenheim and the Middle East Studies Association Academic Freedom Prize for his work with Professor Mugia Gocek, also of Michigan, for bringing together Armenian and Turkish scholars to further study the Armenian genocide. So uh, without further delay, uh, I, now in, I now welcome to the virtual podium, uh, podium uh, Professor Taner Akcham. Taner, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you so much. And good morning to California and uh, good 
day or good evening wherever you are in the world today. Dear Anne and dear Sabu, uh, thank you both for the introduction. Let me first start by thanking the Promise Institute uh, for hosting me and Nasser and the Ararat Sijia Museum for co-sponsoring the event. Today, I would like to speak about my search for an answer to the question of the role of Jamal Pasha in the Armenian genocide. As is known, between November 1914 and December 1917, Jamal Pasha served as commander of the Ottoman Fourth Army, which had control over the region Syria, among others. Before beginning my talk, there are several persons to whom I wish to express my gratitude. My thanks go out to Stefan Ohanian, Awo Gazal, Masis Perk, and Manuk Averian for their assistance in finding and translating Armenian sources for me. I would also like to say thanks to Mark Mamigonian, who participated in lively weekly discussions and debates on my findings and helped me to frame my talk today. I also thank Nasser and the Knights of Vartan Funds for uh, Armenian Studies for their support of this research. Last but not least, my thanks goes to my editor, Paul Bessemer, who worked with me day and night to bring my talk into proper English. Without their contributions, I would not have been able to give this talk today, and I'm indebted to all of them for their assistance. The talk I'm about to give is a difficult one for me. I'm, enti I'm not entirely confident whether I can be really just to the topic. Let me read from my talk here. I could do full justice to the topic here. There are numbers of reasons for this. First and foremost, this is a work in progress. I'm still examining and processing all of the necessary materials that what I'm offering today must be seen as tentative conclusions, not certain facts, needless to say, due to time constraints, I cannot address all aspects of the topic and which thus far has filled close to 100 pages, including a review of the previous scholarship on the subject, a discussion of important methodological problems related to sources and other issues, such as the personal relationship between Talat and Jamal, which I might talk in that issue during the discussion period today. For now, I will present an overview of my findings. But for doing this, I need to share my screen with you. So before maybe uh, going on the topic, I would like to read this quote because these quotes are just the contrary what I'm going to refer here. One is the Aaron Aronsons. Uh, he was the uh, founder of the Nili Secret Organization in, uh, among the Jews, uh, worked with British in 1917-18. And his report to British government 1916 was very interesting actually. And he says uh, on Jamal, on his return trip from Istanbul to Jerusalem, the extra train of the satrap Jamal was often stopped by Armenian delegation who spontaneously, writer makes, this is the Aaron Aronson, makes bold to say this again was a farce, arranged to fool those simple-minded Occidentals. This is how he summarizes actually Jamal's policy. So let me. The existing historiography on the uh, army Jamal Pasha's work, uh, those doing work on Jamal Pasha up to now, can be placed into two opposing groups. At one end are the academic who embraced the official history, 
these are this uh, scholar here that I made a couple of names here. Uh, these scholars see no daylight between Istanbul, central government, I mean with Istanbul, and uh, or Talat, and Cemal Pasha in regard to Armenian policy. Both Istanbul and Cemal Pasha struggled with the myriad difficulties posed by the war in resettling the Armenians in the new region. At the other end of the spectrum are the critical historians, nearly all of whom see clear differences between Cemal Pasha's policies towards the Armenians and those of the Istanbul governments. Although opinions diverge as to the extent or the reasons for these differences, there are even a few who characterize Cemal Pasha as some sort of humanitarian resistance fighter who opposed the central government by secretly working with Germans and or with secret Armenian underground organizations. Certainly, there are exceptions that do not fit neatly into either group. I, for example, argue that there was no meaningful divergence between the Armenian policies of Istanbul and Jamal Pasha. On the contrary, in this sense, at least my assessment of Jamal Pasha ironically stands closer to those denialists who embrace the Turkish regime's official version of history. Talha Çiçek is the other example, even though he's very close to Turkish denialist position, but he also sees a clear difference between Cemal's and Istanbul policies. Cemal in Armenian survivor accounts. Throughout my research, I discovered several uh, legends. There are so many stories and legends in the Armenian sources concerning Cemal Pasha's role, and they are quite revealing. Here I will refer only two of them. One, Cemal had an Armenian vet nurse as a child, and this is the reason for his kindly attitude towards the Armenian, it is said in the legend. And another tale is that when the order came from Istanbul, to not allow even one stray dog to remain standing with the intent clearly meaning to truly eliminate the Armenian population there, Cemal clever, cleverly evaded the order's intent by following its instructions literally and ordering that the street dogs of Syria be killed and the Armenians spared. To the Armenians under his care, he said, simply change your names and take an appropriately Muslim ones. I will then send a cable to Istanbul saying that no Armenians remain here. They are all converted to Islam. There are none left to kill. There are other records in Armenian sources, for example, memoirs, diaries, articles on Cemal Pasha. Patriarch Zaven, well known among Armenians, Patriarch Ormanian from Jerusalem, and the Katalikos Sahak from Sis. They all mentioned very, not very, but they all spoke in positive terms about Jamal and claimed that he didn't allow killing Armenians within his jurisdiction. There are diaries, several of them. I'll give you here one example of Bahram Dadrian, for instance, wrote that the Armenian youth in Syria were being conscripted in the army, but they were subsequently given permission to return their homes. So here is Wahram's entry in the diary on April 16, 1916. The moment the news of our arrival spread through the village, all of the Armenians left their houses and caves assembled in the little square across from our house and praised the name of Jamal Pasha with bravos and wishes that he might live a long life. So I have to underline this is a diary, not a memoir afterwards. Some articles written by Armenian language portray Jamal as saving Armenians. For example, Kevor Hintlian, who claims that he interviewed more than 200 persons in Jerusalem and its environs before writing this article, writes that within the area under Jamal's control as Fourth Army commander, not a single massacre was ever recorded. 
the Armenians were resettled in Syrian cities, Homs, Hama, Damascus, or Jordan on Jamal's own initiative. It's also important, Jamal's own initiative. This. Jamal also ensured that the transfer of a number of religious dignitaries to Jerusalem, chief among them, the Catholicos Sahak. So it was Jamal's initiative to settle Sahak in Jerusalem. Among other good works attributed to Jamal Pasha in these memoirs, articles, and diaries are the opening of special orphanages for Armenian children. This is the Antura, the famous one in Beirut, and mass official conversion of Armenians to Islam in order to save Armenians from massacre. Jamal Pasha in Turkish sources. There are also several memoirs uh, written by Ottoman Turkish statesmen, bureaucrats, and writers who mentioned that Jamal Pasha opposed the go Istanbul government's policies and assisted Armenian deportees. One prime example I would like to give here, Halide Edip. You may have heard her name, the famous feminist Turkish intellectual. And he, she writes, the Armenian world seemed to consider Jamal Pasha as a godsend, and the woman showed me handkerchiefs with his pictures which they carried around their neck. There is a whole possession of miserable Armenians. This is a, from a letter. This is not from her memoir. In 1917, she writes these lines to the finance minister Javid in Istanbul. There is a whole procession of miserable Armenians who severe in the name of Allah and on the glorious head of Jamal Pasha, who has bestowed upon them the right so simply live here. The Armenians say to me, we have awaited your arrival in Syria for two sleepless months. Do something for us. In the world, we only love Jamal Pasha and you. And after uh, Talat's assassination in Berlin, and where Pasha's uncle, he was also a general, Halil Pasha, warned Jamal that he might be the next to be targeted by Armenians to be killed. Jamal responded by saying, ah, come now, dear Halil, why should they kill me? Everyone knows of the assistance I gave the Armenians in Syria. So in order to complete the picture, uh, it is necessary to give a couple examples from the accounts of various German officers and diplomats who served with Jamal Pasha or in the region. In December 1915, German ambassador Metternich informs his superiors that there was indeed a disagreement between Jamal Pasha and the government in Istanbul regarding the Armenians and that Jamal was among those Turks who were ashamed of these policies. Instead of deporting them, the Armenians, to their Zor in Syrian desert, Metternich reports Jamal had succeeded in settling the Armenians' deportees in the environs of Aleppo and in returning to Armenian railroad workers to their job, as well as putting Armenian artisans to work for army. Kress von Kressenstein, a German colonel who served as staff officer in Jamal's retinue, wrote following on, Jamal's, on Jamal after Jamal's assassination 1922. Jamal, quote, Jamal saved the lives of thousands of Armenians and ordered his own grain silos opened, even at the cost of hurting his own military. So Jamal opened the silos, even hurting the Turkish military in order to feed the deportees. He organized sanitation services all along the Armenian deportation route, along with orphanages. He established old age stations to care for the elderly and for medical care, Jamal proved that he possessed chivalrous and human sentiment. So these are some quotes from the existing literature, German, Armenian sources, and Turkish sources on Jamal. So my central thesis is against this current. Contrary to this rosy picture of Jamal presented in the aforementioned sources, based on Ottoman documents, 
I argue that rather than the friend of Armenians, Jamal Pasha actually played a central role in organizing and coordinating the second phase of Armenian genocide and was one of those responsible for the realization of the government's annihilation policies. Not only can we not claim that there were great differences in policy of execution between Jamal and Istanbul government, we can also state that it would be far more accurate to assert near complete coordination in this matter. In certain instances, Jamal even had more radical policy suggestions than the Ottoman government to the point that government felt compelled to moderate his approach, emptying Armenian supply lines, army supply lines of Armenians or deporting Marash Armenians and so on. I'll give you a couple other examples. Uh, there were, of course, some disagreement or debates or differences between uh, central government and the military authorities in Syria. These were clashes between militaries' calculation to win the war and the government's ideological preferences to exterminate Armenians. In the end, and just like during the Holocaust, when similar clashes took place, it was the ideological preferences that uh, were given greater weight. So, as I hope to make clear, I'm claiming that the picture of Jamal Pasha found in the Ottoman archive is markedly different than that found in some of German diplomatic reports, or especially in some of the recollections of Armenian survivors. But I'm not claiming that Jamal Pasha in the Ottoman documents, accurate though they may be, is the whole only truth. Or that the Jamal Pasha found in other sources, in Armenian and German sources, is entirely inaccurate. On the contrary, we could even argue that it is the Ottoman documents which do not fully reflect Jamal's actions on the ground, theoretically possible. We must also accept other primary documents, Armenians and Germans, as containing honest and sincere transmission of things actually seen, experienced, or felt at the time. So the positive, even glowing reports of Jamal Pasha that are found in the reports of contemporary observers and survivors must also be expected, accepted as reflecting a truth, experienced at least by these individuals. The problem is, however, how we can explain these discrepancies between different sources. This is not the place to enter into a profound philosophical debate, discussion on the nature of the truth, or how is the truth constructed retroactively later. I leave this as an important research question, and we might discuss in the question and answer period also. This is my map for you to follow the development in the area. In order to understand Jamal Pasha's role in the Armenian genocide, it is necessary to first be aware of the main characteristic of the second phase of Armenian genocide. The first phase concluded within the removal of the great majority of the Armenian population from the entire Anatolia. And during this phase, the province of Syria was used simply as a dumping ground for surviving deportees without any systematic policy as to what to do with them once they arrived. The second phase was the process of further deportation and massacre of the larger than expected numbers of Armenian deportees who had managed to reach Syria. There is a striking similarity between first and second 
phases of the Armenian genocide. Just as Syria had been used as an all-purpose dumping ground for deportees during the first phase, the environs of Derzor in Syrian desert was used similar purposes in the second. And just as in the first phase, few or no massacres were carried out in the areas where large number of Western diplomatic representatives were to be found, a similar process was seen in Syria in the second phase also. On the Aleppo, you can see in the map, I made a black line for you. On the line Aleppo, Hama, Homs, Damascus line, and to its west, where all of the foreign powers had consular staff or missionaries operating, there were no such massacres. In the provincial capital of Aleppo, the city of Aleppo, Ottoman government followed a similar policy to that of Istanbul, namely by not deporting the local Armenian population. Istanbul local Armenian population were not deported and Aleppo local Armenian population were not also deported. This is another important parallel. Only foreign Armenians in Istanbul and in Aleppo who had survived the track to Syria also would be subjected to further deportation and massacre. There are several other similarities between these two phases. Just as there was the mass arrest of Armenian, largely secular intellectual class in Istanbul on April 24, 1915, a similar symbolic blow was the removal and deportation of the religious leadership in the second. The policies implemented in Anatolia in the first phase, such as the exemption from deportation of artisans whose skills were deemed essential, some Catholic and Protestant Armenians, and the families of conscripts, as long as their numbers did not exceed 5 to 10 percent regulation of the local Muslim population, forced conversion to Islam, and the assimilation of orphaned Armenian children by placing them in orphanages and Muslim homes, were all repeated in Syria. Exactly replica. So without knowing this parallel between the first phase and second phase, without knowing the general climate in Syria, which these were taking place, Jamal Pasha's role cannot be understood. This is my central argument. Shukru Kaya, the guy head of the Directorate of Tribal and Refugee Settlement, was tasked with the matter of organizing the second phase of genocide. Local administrators were asked to come to Aleppo for a meeting and get the directives from Shukru. I will give you a very short glimpse from Ottoman materials how they organized the early phase of October, November. So the first meeting with local leaders would be held on October 1st, 1915. The first decision in Syria was taken was that the foreign Armenians that crowding on, this, crowding on the streets of Aleppo were to be removed from the city. We don't know the exact day, but sometimes between October 7th and 12th, Shukru and Jamal Pasha met and they discussed the affair the related to second phase. Jamal Pasha suggested at that meeting not only emptying the city of Aleppo of Armenians, but also the Armenians along the Pozante. This is the city of Pozante. I hope you can see Pozante all the way down to Aleppo. So this was Jamal's suggestion. The Armenians along the Pozante Aleppo railroads and also Armenian road workers should be deported. For Jamal, the presence of such a great number of densely packed Armenians was both a health risk and security risk for the Ottoman army in the region. Shukri and Jamal decided to deport foreign Armenians in Aleppo to the resettlement area Derzor, Raqqa, and Kerak. 
Kerek is not in this map, it is in Jordan in the south. But mainly Derzor and the Raqqa was the first decision to remove Armenians from Aleppo. And this was mainly Jamal's pressuring also. On October 13, Jamal wrote a special telegram to Istanbul, separate cable, complaining of the huge accumulation of Armenian refugees along the railroad lines and of the necessity of the elimination of the Armenian problem. These are the Jamal's words in the document, at least in regard to the railroad lines and the city of Aleppo. And this was Jamal's proposal, establishing a commission in Aleppo to organize the deportation process in the second place. On October 26, Shukru met with fourth army commanders, not only with Jamal, with other commanders also, where it was decided that the Armenians would be resettled in the province of Syria in numbers not to exceed 10% of the population. And here, to make you very clear, to understand this, uh, in Ottoman map, as you see, Syria is another province. The center of the Syrian province was the Damascus, and Aleppo was the another province, according to Ottoman administrative system. So the Jamal and Shukru decided to settle Armenians in Syria area with 10% population. And per Jamal Pasha's request, new, more appropriate persons were appointed and sent to the Aleppo, Mustafa Abdulhalik Renda as governor, Abdullahat Nuri as director of the deportation affairs, they came to Aleppo. And the director general of security for Istanbul, Ismail Jampolat Bey, he also came to Aleppo for a special meeting with Jamal Pasha. On November 8, this is a very crucial date, we have to keep in mind. On November 8, 1915, there was a crucial meeting under the supervision of Jamal with the participation of individual that I mentioned. Shukru, Abdullah Nuri, Mustafa Abdulhalik, Ismail Jampolat, and Jamal Pasha. They all came together and they made certain important decisions. And their decisions include seven articles. And these seven articles was sent to Istanbul as a decision of the uh, meeting in Aleppo. One of the major issue Jamal was pressuring to deport the railroad workers from the railroad line but this was not accepted by war ministry and were opposed this argument. And Armenian being used for road construction, according to Jamal, were to be dismissed, but it was not accepted by the war ministry. And after this decision 8 November, Mustafa Abdulhalik, the governor of Aleppo, was declared primarily responsible for all the deportation operations, and Jamal had to give the service to him, and the Shukru was recalled to Istanbul. What I presented here is only really a very small glimpse of the documents from the archive, and they clearly show us that there was a fundamental coordination and consultation between those department units responsible for both the deportations and killings. The harmony and not the conflict of the multi-headed decision-making process is really striking. As I mentioned in German documents, and in various Armenian memoirs, a number of practices that appear in the second phase of genocide as present, are presented, presented as evidence of Jamal Pasha's marked benevolence towards the Armenians. If we look into the Ottoman materials, we will see an image just the opposite to claim. Let me give you a couple examples, and you, have, you see them on your PowerPoint. The first point. It is repeatedly 
It is repeated really in the Armenian sources that Cemal Pasha gave a special order to settle Armenians deported from Silesia in southern part of Aleppo province like Homs and Hama and so on. In fact, the settlement of Silesian Armenia was a central government decision and it was sent to region 1st April 24, 1915 and 2nd May 23, 1915. And Cemal acted along with the governors in Aleppo based on these orders. And we have a telegram in our hand on June 28, 1915. For example, Cemal informed Talat that Armenians were being settled in the new areas as ordered from Istanbul in the number not exceeding 10% of the total population. So settlement of Silesian Armenian has nothing to do with Jamal's own gesture or policies. Second point, the relocation of the Catholicos of Sahak in Jerusalem. In all Armenian sources and in all other scholarly work also, it is repeated again and again that it was Jamal who decided to settle Sahak in Jerusalem, even against the wishes of Istanbul government. This is also not correct. Let me summarize how, what the documents tells us. Actually, Sahak was during that period in Aleppo. And the governor of Aleppo during summer months, Bekir Sami, he, tell, he sent a cable to Istanbul saying that Sahak's presence is a danger, security threat in Aleppo. He must be removed. Cemal agreed with that decision, but there was no reaction from Istanbul. When Shukri came to Aleppo in October 1915, Shukri wrote a telegram asking Istanbul to remove Sahak because it will create a security problem, a security risk. And Talat agreed and Cemal confirmed this decision but Talat said, please send them first to a place very close to Urfa and uh, here is the map, Urfa and uh, Aleppo border somewhere here until we uh, give you a final decision. And Shukri make the suggestion again, saying that let's move Armenian to the uh, Munbich, this is the city, but we should not keep Sahak in München. We should send Sahak in Jerusalem. And this was the decision based on Shukru's suggestion. And Talat confirmed the decision. And they gave the job to transfer this decision to Sahak to Jamal Pasha. So Jamal's role was only to inform Sahak about the decision. It was not Jamal's first personal initiative. It was the similar sec, uh, problem with the clearing of the railroad camps. Some German military counselor reports, as well as some Armenian memoirs, state that Jamal Pasha struggled to, the pro to protect the Armenian construction workers who labored in the environs of Adana, Pozanti, Intili, and Osmania. So let me show you the, in the map, this is the area Pozanti on top of it, the blue sign you can see in that area, all the way to Aleppo on the railroad, there were constructions and uh, thousands of Armenian workers in the area. Actually, it was Jamal who wanted to dismiss these workers from the railroads, from the constructions and from the company also. Because Jamal's major problem was that the logistic support line for the military be kept open due to the military shipment troops transports that would begin soon. Jamal Pasha considered Armenians in the area as a security risk. And he was greatly concerned that the Armenian workers would organize sabotage actions that might hold the railroad operations. He was in favor of acting preemptively to solve the problem instead of simply waiting for such actions take place. 
he suggested Armenian workers be immediately replaced with Muslim ones. And if sufficient numbers of Muslim workers couldn't be found, he was ready to take risk the trains not running. So he, he was really quite radical. He risked that the train transfer would be stopped. And he said, that, I don't care. Important thing is to remove the Armenians from there. And on October 10th, 1915, Shukri informed Istanbul. And there was a lot of back and forth between Istanbul and uh, Aleppo. And at the end, the Enver Pasha, the governor, uh, the war minister, because of German minister, uh, German pressure, disagreed with Jamal's proposal to remove the Armenian workers from the railroad. And against Jamal's will, Ottoman government decided to allow 3,000 Armenian workers in the 300, I'm sorry, 300 Armenian workers remain in the area. But in a very short period of time, because of several reasons, the number of Armenians increased to 7,000. And Talat asked Jamal, saying, hey, Jamal Pasha, we gave you permission only for 300. There is 7,000 people there reported Armenian workers. And Jamal responded immediately. I heard the remorse also. I immediately opened an inquiry, and I will start, start immediately deportation of the railroad workers on the area. But the deportation of railroad workers continued until 1916 May, when Adana uh, governor was the Javdat, the previous one governor. So this is the another uh, policy where you can easily see that Jamal Pasha, contrary to the claim in memoirs and German documents was the person who vehemently, very strongly, radically wanted clearing out the rail lane camps and workers from the uh, Posante Aleppo area. Another important radical policy of Jamal was the deportation of Catholics and Protestant Armenians in Maraj. Uh, very short, the story is following, as you know, towards the end of first phase of Armenian genocide, especially beginning of 8, 9th of uh, August 1915, German pressure was very much, and Talat Pasha sent certain telegram to stop the deportation of Catholic and Protestant Armenians. In most of the places, they were already deported in any way. But conflicting to this, his order that the Catholic and Protestant should not be deported, uh, Talat was sending a parallel telegram saying that, yeah, send the suspicious Catholic and Protestants among them also. And here is the most important information for you. Jamal Pasha, from the beginning, was totally against any exceptions. He didn't want that central government make an exemption and allows Catholics and Protestant Armenian remains in Aleppo and in Marash area. And there were so many really back and forth regarding the Catholic Armenians. And for you, the important information is the following again. On April 13, 1916, this was the period when the massacre started. You have to keep in mind, in the second phase of Armenian genocide, killing started in Raqqa Resulain area in the second half of March. And exact during that period, Jamal was fed up with the orders of Istanbul government, keeping Catholic and Protestant Armenians in Marash and area. He sent a special order to the Marash uh, county executive saying that to send all these Armenians from your region. And uh, Talat tried to appease Jamal, saying that Jamal, Catholic Armenians of Marash were not a problem. And Jamal responded that he agrees with Talat's assessment, but states that he, the Armenians remaining in Marash weren't only Catholics and were not only Catholics, there were others. And in any case, even a great number of Catholics were also harmful. So Jamal continued pressuring Marash and Istanbul 
uh, to deport remaining Catholic and Protestant Armenians. And we have this similar picture in Aleppo. This is the what Jamal did continuously. He pushed Aleppo governor to remove the Catholic and Protestant Armenians from the area. And more than that, Talat also ordered Jerusalem, Beirut, other places to remove the Catholic and Armenian, uh, uh, Catholic and Protestant Armenians from the area. And at the end, Talat had to intervene and ask each of these towns and provinces, the list of the Catholics and Protestant Armenian who were sent as based on order of Jamal Pasha that these provinces should create a list and send Istanbul. For example, June 13, 1916, uh, the Jerusalem governor uh, gives a list of Catholic Armenians. We, name, we know, uh, read the names of these guys expelled from the town on Jamal's order. So the picture that emerged from this communication is that Jamal Pasha's treatment of Armenians was harsher than Istanbul's intent, albeit primarily of out of security concerns. For this reason, he found Istanbul's exceptions for Catholics and Protestants to be wrong headed and dangerous. Jamal's other initiatives. As you see or heard from the German and all other uh, Armenian record, it is widespread acceptance that Jamal gave succor to convoys of destitute deportees. You know, in Ottoman documents, it is clear. He, that it was not Jamal's decision. For example, in the German document you read, Jamal opened the army silos and feed the Ottoman, uh, the Armenian deportees, even endangering the Ottoman army. In Ottoman archive, we have dozens of documents where government orders for fourth army to open the silos and to feed the deportees. So the orders to use the army depots coming from Istanbul. And second, Jamal gave medical assistance to the deportees convoys reaching Syria. No, not at all. This was, of course, Jamal was also one of these as the responsible individual in the area, but these are all central government decisions. So there, if you look the Ottoman documents clearly, you will see a regular communication and coordination between center and the local administration. And I should add here that the main goal of all these humanitarian sanitation measure was not the prevention of Armenians death, but to protect the army and local Muslim population. So the third claim you read everywhere that Jamal personally ordered to protect Ar Armenian convoys from attacks and he hanged some Arabs and that the Armenian deputies Zohrab and Vartkes was also arrested by Jamal. This is also not correct. This was all coordinated effort with Istanbul government. And when Jamal wrote in his memoir and in an article in 1919, Frankfurter Zeitung in Germany, where he claimed, says that he says, I captured the killer in the region under my co command. He was totally lying because these two guys were arrested in very close place to around uh, 100, 200 kilometer away from Istanbul. It is the city of Eskişehir. It was arrested by order of Talat Pasha and sent to, uh, Damas uh, to Damascus, yes. And the similar claims that Jamal opened orphanages for Armenian children. This was a government policy opening the orphanage throughout the deportation and throughout the first phase of Armenian genocide. They started establishing orphanages uh, in June, July 1915. And everybody gives the famous example of uh, Antura, as you know. But even before Antura, there were all together 19 orphanages opened in the environs of the Beirut and the Lebanon before Antura uh, was opened. So it was a government policy and it was the same 
the uh, forced conversion to Islam. It was a Ottoman central government policy from the beginning. It was not Jamal's uh, gesture or Jamal's uh, goodwill towards Armenia. It was the Ottoman government's strategic planning. They allowed a certain number of Armenians uh, to convert in Islam. This is what they did in the first phase, and they repeated this in the second phase. We have enough Ottoman materials for this. One of the last points, what was Jamal's active role during this period? Jamal played a very active role when the decision was made to empty the Aleppo and the other refugee camps and the Armenian went sent to Derzor for decimation. First, a travel ban was declared before the sending the deportees from Aleppo all the way to uh, Derzor. Maybe I opened my uh, map. It is better to look uh, the development from the Aleppo all the way to Derzor. And uh, first, a travel ban was hanged. And it was Jamal Pasha first declared this travel ban Jan February 2nd, 1916. And it was extended by Talat Pasha February 13th, 1916. And foreign aid was a serious problem. There was already an Armenian underground organization. Humanitarian aid was given to Armenian deportees. And it was a serious problem. And on February 1916, an order was issued that the aid, any aid to Armenians would be considered as a punishable act. And not only Ottoman employees, but foreigners also would be court-martialed. Jamal was the watchdog of this operation. And Jamal pressured American consular officials, in Young and Jan Jackie Jansen in, in Damascus in Aleppo, to stop organizing relief aid and complain to Istanbul about the activities of these councils. Based on Jamal's constant pressure, the Ottoman government asked Morgenthau to remove these councils from office. And the last important point that Jamal played a role was the threatening German officials who took photos of destitute convoys and or dead bodies and they, Jamal threatened them that he's going to court martial to these German officials. And here is the Jamal's order to Germans. The photographs and the negatives, along with all copies, be turned over to the military police station within 48 hours. Those not surrendering the photographs in their possession shall be arrested, tried and punished for the crime of taking unauthorized photographs in a war zone. So this was again from Jamal. Last point. One of the telegraphic message is used as proof of Jamal's humanitarian concern for the Armenian and his opposition to their extermination. This is the German document. In a, I'm sorry, this is the Ottoman document from Ottoman archive. In a cable, 2nd October 1915, the governor of Syria, Hulusi Bey, informed Talat in Istanbul that Hulusi, the governor, had received two separate cables from Jamal on September 13th and October 1st in which Jamal warned that if the Armenians arriving in Syria were not resettled in an orderly fashion, a large part of them would perish and that humanity would not record with this with high regard. This is the line you can see in the archive also. And requesting that such medieval actions be forcibly prevented. And in the same document, this is the second page from the same telegram, Jamal demands of governor that the reputation of the Fourth Army's area of authority 
remain honorable and not be sullied by such events. What Jamal wanted Armenians to be resettled, and this would be an honorable act, both in the name of governor and of the state as a whole. This is an important telegram, indeed. And if we consider in a vacuum, it might be understood that to clearly show the humanitarianism of Jamal. However, it is very problematic to develop a thesis based on a single document and ignore all other that portray a different Jamal with his actions and other telegrams. Instead of simply taking this document at face value, we should consider this telegram along with Jamal's threatening letters to German officials or his famous attempt to empty Aleppo and the railroad workers or to pressure Istanbul forced to remove the American consuls because of their relief aid to deportees or to send Marash Armenians to their Zor to extermination or Armenians from Aleppo, Catholic and Protestant Armenian from Aleppo. We should put in the context. Finally, and most importantly, we must really put this in the context of other Ottoman documents. Here is my point. We should emphasize that it was a common practice. The Ottoman civilian and military officials had standard wording in many of their communications about measures to protect Armenian convoys, to distribute food and provide sanitation needs, etc. This deception was an important structural characteristic of the Armenian genocide. Here an example for you. I put a telegram of Talat Pasha on August 29, 1915. Talat sends a cable to all provinces, Ottoman provinces, saying that the Armenian provinces policy had been solved. There is no need to sully, to sully the honor of the nation or the government with excessive cruelties. The similarities between Talat's and Jamal's sentences are striking. What Talat had stated for the entire country, the nation's honor should be saved. Talat was, Jamal was saying for the Syria. And Talat saying actually more in that telegram. He was saying also that uh, the boldness he was referring to a massacre in Ankara region and saying the boldness of the people and gendarmes on duty in committing rape and robbery, in pursuing their inflaming animalistic feelings has created, caused greatest distrust and concern of central government. After this, he says, Talat, the government demanded that all Armenians be protected from all manner of assault and robbery. And officials, Talat threatened the Ottoman officials, officials who were discovered to have involved in any manner of assault will be held responsible according to their administrative rank and sent to the court martial. So to accept as authentic the utterances of Jamal to Hulusi, while simultaneously rejecting those written by Talat is a position that doesn't stand up logical scrutiny. The most important question to ask is why Talat and Jamal use this kind of language in their communication? We might discuss this in the question and answer period, but let me give you one important context, a good clue for this. After sending this telegram on August 29, 1915, Talat took this telegram, the original of telegram, to German embassy and to show as evidence that the ultimate aim of Ottoman government only to resettle, resettle Armenians and exactly at the same day, August 13th, Jamal, when Talat was visiting German embassy in Istanbul, Talat 
meeting with the chief of the German secret service operative in Damascus and Jamal was handing over similar telegram to him to show that the Ottoman government policy was only to resettle the Armenian. So this indicates a perfect coordination between Talat and Jamal. Thank you for listening. So I have to. Uh, thank you very much, Tane, for that wonderful talk. Um, before we move on to uh, Ron Suni with his uh, commentary, I'd like to make a small announcement concerning the uh, questions by the audience members. Uh, please, if you haven't, if you missed the introduction, you might not have caught this. Please ask the, uh, your questions in a concise manner in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, so uh, now I invite uh, Professor Ronald Suni to make his comments. Thank you, Sebu. Thank you, Tanner. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this is a wonderful event and a really interesting time. And uh, it occurs to me that what Tanner is doing, which is increasing our knowledge through his careful work on uh, in the archives uh, about Jamal Pasha and the second phase of the genocide, is revisionism in the best sense of the word because that's what we do as historians. We refine, we revise, we make more accurate, we add new knowledge, and he's doing that very well. And at the center of, uh, uh, at the center of um, uh, his uh, uh, story is in fact, the relationship between Talat Pasha and Jamal Pasha. One of my students asked me, uh, all these Pashas, uh, is, is, were they brothers? Were, is this one family, They're the Pasha brothers? And I had to explain that no Pasha means general uh, or high official in, in the Ottoman Turkish and they were not related. They were not Akrabala, they weren't relatives. They weren't even Khanamis, that is uh, in-laws. They were distinct figures with their own jurisdictions and their own interests. And as Tana has shown deeply intimately related. Tanner starts appropriately by placing his findings within the historiographical debates between those who have argued that Jamal Pasha protected Armenians and those who claim he carried out uh, itihadist, itihadist uh, genocidal policies. Tanner begins by showing that there is no correlation in the historiographical field between the two sides on the genocide debate, that is on, at one extreme denialists, and those who argue that 1915 was a genocide. Uh, and the views on the other side held by historians on, uh, on Jamal. So there, these, the, there is no matchup between these things. For instance, Hilmar Kaiser, who recognizes the genocide, actually argues that Jamal was a nice fellow when it came to Armenians and goes as far as to claim that the one person I'm quoting here who saved most Armenians in World War I was nobody other than Jamal Pasha. Whereas Turkish historian Tahal Cicek, who is a denialist, in fact argues that there was a divergence between Istanbul and Jamal. I'm quoting again, Jamal did not aim at the Turkification or Islamization of the deported Armenian community as generally claimed in the existing literature. His actions were mainly an attempt to shape the conduct of the Armenians in the interest of Ottoman unity. So other scholars who have seen a difference between the ferocity of Istanbul toward the Armenians and the moderation as it, they thought was occurring of Jamal Pasha include people as distinguished as Vahakin Dadrian, Raymond Kevakian, Vahe Tashjan, Hans Lukas Kieser, who has written the major Western biography of Talat Pasha, Bedros Der Matosyan, Umit Kurt, a student of, 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 of uh, Tanner's, and myself. So that's pretty good company to be in, actually. But apparently, we were wrong. 
The views that there were significant differences between Jamal Pasha's policies and treatment of the Armenians and those of the central government in Istanbul are also collaborated or corroborated by numerous memoirs by Armenians who suffered in the genocide and survived either in Ottoman orphanages or by luck or their own tenacity. And if that weren't enough, as Tanner points out, there were Turkish memoirs like those of Halide Edip Adevar, Ali Fuad Eldem, and Fali Rifki Atay. And in this example, Halide Edip, for example, writes, Jamal Pasha in Syria had taken a protective attitude toward the Armenians settled there. They were, not, they were not to be molested in any way in the lands under his control. German consuls as well uh, uh, are also sort of support this view that there was a distinction between uh, Talat and, and, and Jamal, Istanbul and Aleppo. Even the architects of the genocide, Talat himself and Dr. Nazim, as well as Jamal in his memoirs, believe that Jamal provided assistance to the Armenians. That's a lot of evidence there, but uh, that's the landscape, the historiographical landscape, the frame within which Tander makes his case. And against this virtual tide uh, the, uh, of evidence and the consensus of most historians, Tander takes the opposite position and argues boldly and courageously and with tremendous evidence from the archives that Jamal's policies were actually in line with the Committee of Union and Progress's leadership, that is with Talat and others uh, in Istanbul. Now his approach is to use Ottoman archival documents and historians in general consider that archival documents are the ultimate source that they talk to us in a way, and they are to cons be considered the most uh, authorita uh, authoritative sources. And from his investigations in the archives, uh, Tanner finds that Jamal Pasha, I'm quoting here, actually played a central role in organizing and coordinating the second phase of the Armenian genocide, and was one of those responsible for the realization of the government's annihilistic policies. Not only can we not claim, he goes on, that there's no great difference either in policy or in its execution between Jamal Pasha and the Istanbul government, it would be far more accurate to assert near complete coordination in this matter. Now that's, unquote, that's pretty categorical. Indeed, he will say that Jamal in some ways was more genocidal, more eliminationist than even Talat Pasha. What Talnard is attempting to do in this lecture, it seems to me is extraordinarily important. As I mentioned, I think even courageous. He's swimming upstream, but he's doing it forcefully and with a tremendous reserve of evidence. He wants to give us a rounded, more complex picture of Jamal and the second phase of the genocide, which is probably the least well-studied period of the genocide. That is the period after the mass killings and deportations from Anatolia, when Armenian survivors then were living in the deserts, in the towns uh, and deserts of Syria and underwent further deportations, conversions and massacres. So let me discuss what I think are the major findings in Tanner's essay and lecture and how we might uh, uh, usefully think about them and in some ways ask for more or see some uh, critical points that should be better explained. So Tanner shows similarities between what happened in Anatolia and what is going to go on in the second phase. Uh, and he shows with that beautiful black line that there were few or no massacres carried out either in Anatolia, think about Western Anatolia, Izmir and, and Istanbul and other places, where there were Western diplomatic representations. And, we, and the same was true in Syria as well. On the Western part of that black line, uh, Armenians were not massacred, they occurred to the East. That's a really interesting finding. He shows again, secondly, that 
in the discussions that went on among the uh, young Turks about how to treat Catholic and Protestant Armenians, Jamal Pasha showed himself more radical than the Istanbul government. Now, you remember that in the Ottoman Empire, your identity was largely a religious identity. So uh, they, you belong to a millet, uh, the Ermeni millet,i or the Yahudi millet,i or the Rum millet,i or whatever, and it was uh, it was religion primarily that that gave you that identity. So when Armenians or others converted to Catholicism or Protestantism, they actually had to move into other millets, which were formed for them. And so th there was a, a debate about whether you treat these people according to what had been the standard. Ottoman identification, which is religion, or whether you think, think of them in some other way, this is a really interesting question that should be examined further uh, in terms of ethnicity or what was popular at the time, uh, race, the idea of some kind of racial, cultural, or biological identification. Uh, and Jamal seems to have been ready to act more forcefully against Protestant and Catholic Armenians I think uh, Tanner shows that pretty well, then uh, Talat and Istanbul. Tanner admits and says, not admits, but in fact shows us that there were disagreements on some issues between Talat and Jamal, uh, primarily over the jurisdiction of the army and the civilian administration, but other matters as well, like the turf war around the Armenian Catholicos of Sis, Sahak. He goes on to show, and this is a very interesting finding, that just as in the West and in Anatolia, the uh, CUP had first decapitated the nation by eliminating the uh, uh, intellectual class in Istanbul, largely secular people like Krikor Zorab, uh, on April 24th, 1915, depriving Armenians of their political leadership. And by the way, it should be noted their ability to carry out this mythological insurrection, which our, uh, deniers claim Armenians were capable of and interested in. The same or a similar thing happens in Syria in the second phase, but there, since this secular elite has largely been decimated or eliminated, there it's the removal and deportation of the religious leadership, the, the last elite left to, to the Armenians of that area. What's very interesting is, and in some of my own work I found, when Armenians got to uh, the, the end game, the end of the trail of the deportations, they made another Armenia there. They reestablished themselves, those who did not perish or were so ill that they couldn't revive, and they began setting up businesses and uh, artisanal uh, shops, etc. cetera. Um, and I think what Tanner shows is that ultimately, whether or not this was tolerated for a time, there was an elimination of any possible revival of communal life of the Armenians. So they got rid of the elite, and then they also uh, make sure that there's no revival of, of a, a kind of coherent Armenian community. And Tanner finally shows uh, that, that Jamal's largest and most important priority, his greatest priority, was that the roots of the army's logistical support be kept open, that military transport be accessible, and to eliminate the Armenian refugees who were uh, clogging up those lines of, of communication. Tanner's evidence centers primarily on correspondence between Talat and Jamal, not entirely, but very heavily. And he sees Talat and Jamal as almost two close relatives. But I have to ask this question. Does this mean that Jamal, two years older than Talat, senior, at least in age to Talat, did not have ambitions that exceeded his affection for Talat? If his orders were seen to contradict Istanbul's directive, as he was accused of, by the way, by the district governor of Jerusalem, uh, if in fact um, th there were real contradictions in the telegrams that he sent, that would have been a serious 
uh, uh, defection or a serious challenge to Istanbul. So it's not surprising that telegrams to Talat would almost certainly have denied any difference with the policies that he was carrying out or might have preferred uh, in the East. Tanner has been very good in his work to show how deceptive, uh, how contradictory, how um, uh, uh, in disguising the uh, language of the telegrams were, and he did that in the end of his talk as well. Natalie Zeman Davis, a wonderful historian of medieval Europe, wrote a wonderful book called Fiction in the Archives. And the thesis of, of uh, Zeman Davis's work is that people, that the archives of course are created by people for certain purposes. And the documents in there are conceived and written in languages with rhetorical tricks that serve certain purposes. And they are a kind of fiction as well. Though they tell us something, they have to be read against the grain. And these kinds of archival documents have to also be read very carefully to see what's being hidden, what face is being shown, and how much that covers up other ambitions, uh, other, other uh, intentions, uh, other strategic uh, uh, aims of, of the actors far away from Istanbul. While one can really doubt, it seems to me, the expressions of love and sincerity and see them as dissimulation, it's very hard to suspect as insincere expressions of anger or accusation of deception. And there are instances where Jamal is upset and complains about accusations made by Talat and Istanbul against him. In other words, I would take those expressions of, of, of the dis difference of anger, accusations, of, of, of complaints much more seriously than these rhetorical flourishes of love and sincerity and uh, seeming agreement. A wider picture indeed, if we put these stories and correspondences in, in context and show what was actually carried out and at what rate it was carried out and then how it was characterized, we might see that the differences, nuanced as they might be, are actually real and have to be taken into consideration. There's a real important political science idea called the principal agent problem. Principles, that is the boss, the higher ups, in this case, Istanbul, have a lot of trouble controlling agents out there far away in the provinces. And isn't there possibilities and can we find evidence that in fact, Talat as principal and Jamal as agent, in fact, uh, did not agree on all things. And Talat says that was true, but not so much uh, as the Armenians. So uh, this is, these are, are my, my questions. Um, I'm, I'm worried if, not, there's, if there's not a kind of elaborate cover-up that's going on, not only to convince Germans and Austrian allies that the Armenian policy was limited to deportation and relocation, not to mass murder, but also even between uh, these leaders. Talat in general has convinced me that the more romantic views that Jamal opposed the genocide or was less cruel than Talat no longer can be upheld. I myself, when writing my own book, They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, was very careful uh, not to claim that he was uh, that different from, uh, from the central intentions. Uh, the work there, the research there was still quite thin. The documents that, uh, uh, Tala, uh, that uh, Tanner has found were not yet fully elaborated or known. Uh, so uh, 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 one couldn't make those kinds of judgments. And if you used the sources that were available, the picture looked much rosier than the one that, that Tanner has now filled in. Tanner uh, has shown that Talat Pasha was a masterful perpetuator of genocide, a malevolent genius, 
but he never, it seems to me, had the kind of full control over all of his agents that may be implicated uh, in this, this account. Because I'll agree that Jamal also is a perpetrator of genocide, also a malevolent genius, but he may have had his own, um, own views and they were distinct. So I'm gonna ask the following several questions. One, is there a way we can explain how the opinion of so many eyewitnesses, German uh, consuls, people of the time, historians who have looked into this in detail, how, why the, the opinion of so many diverges from this new account that uh, Tanner has brought to us, which is so compelling. Part of the answer Tanner supplies is what I'll call his famous black line, because where there were European officials, as in Aleppo, Holmes, and elsewhere, there were no massacres, or in Istanbul, or in, in Izmir, uh, while there were in the desert, like in places like Derzor. But really, rumors of mass killing couldn't cross that black line. Really, people didn't have uh, uh, movement and mobility between these zones that would have uh, shown people what was really going on. And the final question I wanna ask, and it's, it's a, in a way a bigger question, and it's one that would get into really big questions uh, that have uh, perplexed and uh, uh, um, uh, made life difficult for historians of the genocide. And that would be something like this. What was Jem Jamal's idea of the future of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire? Was it elimination of Armenians? Was that what he was after? Was it in part conversion as in the orphanages? Was it allowing settlements of Armenians up to five or 10% in out of the way places? Was it in fact using them somehow as a commercial group to develop Syria, which was maybe going to be a kind of local zone of control by Jamal? A lot of these different things seem to be in play at once and uh, they need to be sorted out. An answer to this question of what Jamal's idea of the future of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire might illuminate the bigger question of what the ultimate goals of the young Turks was. What kind of nationalizing empire did they envision after this disastrous campaign of mass killing and deportation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron, for uh, a wonderful summary and uh, focus of the, uh, on the lecture itself. Uh, we will begin our questions now, but before we begin, before I field some questions from the audience, I have a general question myself that I'd like to pose leading up, uh, following on uh, Ron's uh, suggestions several times during his commentary. And that is that my question to Taner is, has to do with the rosy picture uh, uh, of um, Jamal Pasha that has been developing over the last uh, uh, years. And so the question I have is, your, your lecture focused mostly on the actual events on the ground, on history per se, and not on historiography. I'm, I'm interested in the historiographic dimension of this uh, revisionism concerning, the, uh, top, concerning Jamal Pasha. And, uh, I couldn't help but to notice that uh, Talha Chichek's work of 2016 on uh, Syria and the Ottoman Syria, I think it's called Syria in World War I, played an important role, almost like the center of a spoke of revisionist accounts. And I'm wondering whether uh, you, th you share that opinion, whether most of this revisionism of, on Jamal Pasha began, began with the Chichek publication or whether it has roots that are deeper than that in terms of the positive uh, account of Jamal Pasha. Uh, is there a revisionist account, in other words, before 2016, before only a few years ago? Thank you so much. Uh, I, or, um, thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the questions. Okay. What I try to do actually is the beginning, that puts that way. And uh, it is really an humble attempt 
uh, I like the uh, revisionism uh, term is a good way to put it, uh, that we really at the beginning of a serious uh, research project or discussion to understand genocide. And we need really more serious work in that area. And uh, my, is this, I mean, as uh, I said at the beginning, uh, this is a paper around 100 pages. And I only could refer only maybe one third of the points that I discussed in these 100 pages. And uh, there are several other aspects and we should go into it. If I can raise some question at the end of this lecture, I would be very happy. Not to find definite answers, but new, very serious questions. Let me start with the last one, Sebo's, the historiography. It started actually in 1918. It's in my paper in Jamanak, the Armenian newspaper in Istanbul, published already a very rosy picture of uh, Jaman. Uh, quoting from uh, Ormanian and from Sahak and so on. 1918 already. This is a widespread belief among the uh, Armenian survivors. So this is a very serious problem. We cannot solve now here. We should, this is a research problem. Why survivors developed these kind of perceptions? Not only the Talats attempt Jamals to hide all the crimes and so on. There must be something in the victim of the people. This is a very deep social psychological question. One aspect is they have to give a meaning to their survival. Why they survive? It could not be government policy because these are the bad guys they are trying to kill and exterminate. So they needed to give a meaning to their survival. If it's not the resistance, this is one way to give a meaning to the survival. If not, then you have to create certain stories that a good man among the perpetrator that can save your life. So this is very important point that we need really young scholars goes through the Armenian sources and look into them how this necessity emerges a different man to discover. But I have to warn ourselves. I picked, of course, for the topic, certain Armenian memoirs. If you read some memoirs from the Caucasus area, you have another German picture. So there are also Armenian memoirs you can find that speaks not so highly about Jamal. Important thing is, without any prejudgment, we need young scholar with Armenian knowledge go and really search this topic. This is a very crucial issue, not one issue. Armenian can, knowledge is very crucial, and this hasn't been done yet. And what these Armenian uh, and well, thanks God, I, uh, most of these kind of literature I read, Holocaust is very advanced. They already made this kind of discussion. One central rule in Holocaust literature, if you discuss a perpetrator and role of a perpetrator, would you rather look into victims' uh, accounts or would you rather look the perpetrator's account to create an uh, image of it? Christopher Browning, uh, Paul Hilbert, they all ask this question. Christopher Browning, when he was in Israel, he spoke to a group of Jews and the Jewish listener in this room criticized him. Why you used only the German sources? Why not the Jewish survivors? Then he said, I want to look into the relationship between perpetrators. Would you really think that a Jewish man in concentration camp can give me more insight than the relation of two perpetrators uh, uh, the documents that it reveals the fact. So the question here is a very important methodological question. We should not really categorize or develop a hierarchy among the sources, but we should first ask our question, what is our question? 
and we should look the sources accordingly. This is the really an important methodological question, and I hope we will start really similar debate in Armenian genocide research also. Regarding the Talat Jamal relations and all other issues, let me give a very short uh, answer or cover it in a different way. We have three major sources related to perpetrators' attitude uh, or Talat Jamal relations. One is the archival materials that I used extensively. The second one, which was not used extensively in our field, are the letters after 1918 November, when Talat Enver Jamal escaped to Europe and then later to Moscow, their main way of communication was writing letters. Hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of letters. I read most of them. They are available in Ankara in Turkish Historical Society. And some of them are published also. What I, th this is the second important source, the letter exchange between Talat Enver, Jamal, and the other uh, ruling uh, elite of the Union and Progress Party. And the third, of course, the memoirs. If we put all these together, Ron, at the end, what can we say about Talat and Jamal relation? There is definite, there was a big concurrence, there was a big fight between Enver and Jamal. Jamal actually had an I on Elmer's position, period. It was so clear. And you can read a lot about their interrelation problems and so on. The fascinating part for me is within Ottoman materials, archival materials, and within the materials in the letters and in the memoirs, you can find all kinds of disputes, discussions, problems, but there is one topic they never discussed or debated, and we have to take it as fact, because there was a common understanding. It was not a topic at all for them. And even though it is the, the most interesting point, let me tell you, in these letters, for example, that they wrote to each other, Talat to Jamal, Jamal to Anwar, and so on and so on, hundreds of letters, never they raised the question of uh, Armenian problem and their attitude. I mean, if they had certain differences, they would have talked in that letters because Jamal talks about certain problems that he had during the war years with others. But this Armenian issue was a ghost everywhere. First public appearances of Jamal was in Frankfurt Zeitung 1919 and where he started defending Talat. And he called his my comrade and called this the guy that we, Aynu Dava Adam is, that we commit our life for the same cause. So very clear defense of uh, Talat in that regard. So you see that the differences in all other issues can be traced in Ottoman materials and in other sources, but not the Armenian ones. This is very important. When it comes to Armenian question, my understanding from all these sources, even the memoirs also, uh, they agree on that. If there is no discussion, then you can say that there is a result of agreement. You don't need really to prove it. But it is, the process is very complicated. Let me give you one more example, then maybe going further, other question and answer. For example, this is an argument against Ottoman documents that I highly now use a lot. I never find a single document, for example, that Bahat Dishaki and Dr. Nazim was indeed in Syria, beginning of 1917. What they, were they doing there? Why did they go there? There are a lot of gossip publication on the Union and Progress Party. You can read some stories why Bahati Shaki was there. 
And I was really surprised reading in one memoir, this is the governor of the Aleppo, Mustafa Abdul Hadi Prenda, maybe for the listener, it's a wonderful uh, closing remark. There were three guys and dining in an evening. Bahattin Shachi, Abdullah Nuri, uh, Abdul, uh, Mustafa Abdul Harik, and third guy, Mustafa Kemal Atat. They were having nice conversation beginning of 1917 in Aleppo. So there are certain issues also excluded from the archival materials. And what is Jamal's overall vision in a Turkish empire period? He was more ideologically Turkish than Talat and the other. I made a, actually for this list a talk, uh, maybe there will be a question like that, on which points they fight with each other. And one of these points was the really problem of Turkification. And in their uh, terminology, in their document, they used a term. This is not only uh, Talat, not only Jamal, I discovered this in almost all other important really documents. I'm trying to find the uh, this term, how they use reducing the number of Armenian to a level that they cannot be considered as proud. This is the term, harm to make a harmful majority and harmless minority. Talia Chichek uses this to expose Talia. But I'm sorry, to expose Jamal, saying that you see Jamal saying, making harmless majority, I'm sorry, uh, harmless majority to uh, a minority. This is the term Talia uses. This is the term Mustafa Abdul Halik Randa uses. This is the decision when they decided to decide to exterminate in Syria the Armenian, Abdullah Nuri used this term, to reduce the number in a level that they cannot be uh, a problem. So this was, uh, Ron, it's in your, uh, you already mentioned, Jamal's, Talat's, and all unionists to destroy any possibility, revival of Armenian life social life, wherever it might be. This was their main policy and there was a total agreement on that. Great, thank you very much, Tanner. Um, we have actually a large number of questions uh, for you. So we'll try to curate a few of them in the remaining time. Some of our questions have pertained to Jamal's role in advancing the genocide of Armenian Catholics and Armenian Protestants. Was that actually significantly different from uh, the attitude toward Armenian Apostolic or Orthodox uh, Christians? Um, were they viewed very differently, even if the um, execution of the actions against them occurred in different time periods? Perhaps you could elaborate on that. I mean, my answer is very short. It was German, pressuring Talat. And as a political man in Istanbul, Talat had to make some concessions. They needed financial aid from Germany. They need military aid from Germany. And German government literally pressured, they, especially beginning of uh, mid of July, one diplomatic note after another. And this was the only remedy for Talat to send these orders to the region, at least to some Catholic Armenians survive, and it was not Jamal's interest. Jamal was a military man, and he didn't make any distinction. And his, this is the, the this distinction between, difference between Jamal and Talat was the difference between a military man and a politician. A politician had to make concession, but military man deals only with the security issue. Period. Thank you. I'll have I'll ask one more quick question before we go back to uh, Sebu Aslanian. There is a very um, specific question here pertaining to Jamal's honeymoon, which was taken in Izmir in 1922 during the slaughter that was taking place there. Uh, the questioner asks, is it true that uh, Jamal supervised the sealing of the city and the burning and the murders during that period? Are you aware of that? 
uh, Germany was assassinated 1922 July, so it was day before the burning of Saint. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next is a question from another uh, participant who wants to know why the uh, railroad workers or Armenian in particular posed any dangers, if you could elaborate on, on that. Tanya. Because the Ottoman government considered Armenians as a threat, as a problem makers, troublemakers, and as a security man, Jamal really was afraid of Armenian sabotage acts corroborating with Great Britain's. Uh, you know, before uh, the debate on the railroad uh, workers, uh, Jamal was in charge of uh, suppression of the uh, Marash uh, event, 1915 March. He was also very harsh in suppressing the Marash Armenians. And one of the reasons why he was against the Catholic and Protestant, I forgot to add, Jamal believed that especially Protestant Armenians are inclined to corroborate with British. So he had a very clear security concern. And this was his major, major uh, goal to remove these Armenians because he's scared of the uh, act, sabotage act of the Armenians. And everybody maybe knows who deals with Armenian genocide already with the beginning of the uh, general mobil, uh, mobilization, August 2nd, 1914, Already, Ottoman government sent a circular to all provinces considering Ar Armenians as a security threat and that they should be really put under surveillance. So uh, this is the main concept. Armenians were, according to their understanding, uh, a problem. And it's very interesting, Naim Efendi, the book, uh, the memoirs that I published, in his me memoir, Naim says, these poor Armenian uh, railroad workers, despite all this mistreatment, none of them, None of them throughout this period even move their finger and they work really very hard so that the trains should move around. Thank you. So there, there are another uh, couple of questions pertaining um, more recently. Uh, in fact, not that long ago, there was a visit to UCLA by uh, Jamal Pasha's grandson. Uh, whom you may know, uh, Hassan Jamal, and where he openly acknowledged the Armenian genocide and his grandfather's role in it. Um, have you had any interactions with him? Has the Turkish public, has he said anything different in recent years? Has the Turkish public uh, responded differently to him and others uh, since that time? After that, he published his memoir, Hassan Jamal. It's available in Turkish. And not only I read, of course, his memoir, I also uh, communicated with him, asked him whether he has anything else more uh, to say what is written in the memoir. He said that I already put everything there. And uh, this is mainly uh, silence in the family. It hasn't been spoken much. And uh, this is one, uh, there is nothing more in that sense. And Jamal is where uh, Hassan Jamal put in the memoir whatever he uh, really found out. And he put some images, uh, pictures and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would like to make one point. It is important for the uh, people to understand. You know, uh, this is my uh, theory. Uh, uh, not theory, there is a... Uh, term, I don't know whether I can use, Occam's Razor, this is a saying, uh, it's a very famous saying, uh, and I use, this is the simplest way to explain actually Jamal's role. You know, in Ottoman documents, I found, I mean, there are several, but eight major discussions, dispute and disagreement between Jamal and Talan. For example, Jamal arrested various citizens of Antetan power, the British citizens, and Jamal's want to really hang them, I mean, uh, kill them. And this created a big diplomatic problem. You can find a lot of information in the archive. Or Jamal prohibit display sign in the workplaces. He asked to sign, to put on the Turkish sign. 
And this created a huge problem because there were a lot of German companies using German names. So this is another, you can find. Or Jebeli Lubnan, this is a, a province in Beirut at that time. And Jamal wrote a special uh, bylaw for this uh, county. This is the central control actually, more dictatorial regime. And he drafted this and Istanbul delayed this. And there is a huge debate about this. You can find in the Ottoman archive. Or Jamal ordered extra taxes in Syria, for example, to establish a hospital. And Talat, it drove, drove Talat crazy. Say, finance minister came in because it's illegal that the army officer really put extra taxes. And Talat says, hey, what are you doing there? Remove these extra taxes. Or another problem. There was gold in the hand of uh, people there. Uh, and Jamal ordered to exchange paper money of the government, worthless, with the gold by force. And he was collecting gold from people. And this was also unlawful. And Talat had to intervene. And you have really uh, find several, dozens, dozens of uh, email exchanges. I'm sorry, email exchanges. Dozens of uh, exchanges on that one. And of course, on Arabs, on Jews, not in the uh, essence, but uh, whether or not, for example, the uh, Jerusalem should be empty, or whether or not the Arab should be hanged. Uh, Istanbul never opposed the Arab policies of Jamal. This is another issue that we have to revisit here. But only timing was a problem. And you can find really dozens, dozens of documents in the archive. But you cannot find anything these similar debates on Armenian question. So my theory, if there had been any disagreement, there would have been a discussion. Jamal was not a guy, this is very important, who saved his words. I mean, in my 100 uh, pages in long text, I make a lot of quotation from his really very heavy handed word against Allah. So this is the one important point that I want to say. So I believe we are running out of time and I will close with a final uh, question that is compressed and I'll rephrase it in this way. Um, as you know, or you might know, the Italian historian Benedetto Croce famously said, all history is contemporary history. That is to say historians write about the past informed by current events and so forth and values and, and things that shape their lives. So in line with this way of thinking, the question that I have from the, from the participant, uh, from the uh, uh, audience member has to do with parallels, if any, between what's going on in uh, Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh over the last uh, three weeks, if not longer, and the genocide itself. Many Armenians see uh, more than an echo and a parallel in what's going on. So the question to you is, where do you, do you see any uh, comparisons here or any relevance of the, of the past of history to the present? I think Ron can say more than uh, on that topic as somebody, I mean, uh, when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh, Ron is one of the historians that I use his writing. So I <laughs> can hardly really talk here as an expert I always say, I mean, Jirai uh, Livaridian, Stefan Austrian, Ron Suni, and Richard Tawanesian, these are the guys from them. I learned something on Garabakh conflict. So I know my boundaries related to that part of the problem. So Ron can say more on that aspect, but definitely at least there is one point, who can deny that Armenian people in Garabakh really view the entire conflict today through the prism of history. It is for them a new genocidal danger there. And they are looking really very traumatized. And one of the reasons Turkish denialism is one of the central problems that never made past the past, but the past is the present today, especially in Garabakh. Thank you. Ron, you want to say? If no, I'll follow that. I agree completely with Tanner. Um, this is the power of history, right? Or getting trying to get history right, as Tanner did so beautifully today. Uh, 
the lens through which Armenians see the Karabakh conflict is the lens of the genocide. And there is terror and fear that this new uh, Azerbaijani aggression, and there's no dis real dispute about who started this particular war and what their aims are, uh, is, is like a genocide. Now, I would say as a historian of genocide and as a thinker on these questions, I would hope this is not genocidal. That is, this is not uh, a moment at which Azerbaijani, uh, Azerbaijan is interested in or capable of eliminating Armenians. Armenia will defend itself and presumably the major power in the region that is Putin's Russia will ultimately do what it should be doing and accept the responsibility that it is the mediator and the arbitrator of this area and come and defend Armenia against this aggression. Great, thank you. Thank you both uh, Tanner and Ron for a very stimulating lecture and discussion. These are very important contributions to our understanding of the role that the leadership of the Young Turks, in particular Chamal Pasha, played in the planning and execution of the Armenian Genocide. And it, um, as you have so eloquently stated, Ron has given us very helpful insights into what is happening today. Um, I'm sure that our audience will continue to be very interested in the subject of uh, today's lecture and will be interested in following up through the many publications and documentary evidence that you both uh, have available. I'm also, by the way, happy to have learned that tomorrow is Tanner Akjam's birthday. So let me be the first to wish you, Tanner, a very happy birthday in continued good health. So let me close our webinar by reminding the audience of our upcoming Zoom-based conference uh, next Saturday, October 31st, from 10 a.m. until 5.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. The subject is Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, and the Palimpsests of Conflict, Memory, and Violence. This has been organized by Professor Sebu Aslanian and will be available for viewing via the Zoom webinar format. Please be sure to visit our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute website or visit us on social media to learn about how you can uh, obtain a Zoom link to watch this very important webinar. Uh, in which Professor Suni will be one of many uh, participants and speakers. In the planning stages as well as our next Promised Armenian Institute Distinguished Lecture, which will be given uh, by Professor Ronald Suni. This will take place in early 2021. So please join us, uh, join our listserv through our website to receive further updates on this and other uh, Promised Armenian Institute programming. So again, thanks to all of you. Thanks to Professor Akjan, Professor Suni, Professor Aslanian for your contributions to this lecture. Thank you for your attendance to the audience. And we look forward to having you participate in future events for the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA.